Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of the origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Lindsay McMillan Brown. Dr. McMillan Brown is a research engineer at NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. She received her PhD in chemical engineering from Yale University in 2019 for work in material design and nano patterns for improved solar cell light harvesting. Soon thereafter, she was awarded a $2 million NASA Early Career Initiative Research Grant to develop a method to print solar cells in space. Tonight, Dr. Brown will talk to us about that work, Powering the Next Frontier, Manufacturing Solar Cells in Space. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McMillan Brown. Thank you for that kind introduction and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here uh, to discuss my research with you. And I really appreciate that you've taken out the time to share uh, your evening with me. So America has entered a new era of exploration. Uh, with NASA's Artemis program, we're going to lead humanity forward to the moon and prepare us for the next giant leap which is the exploration of Mars. Since humans last walked on the moon about 50 years ago in the Apollo program, the robotic exploration of deep space has experienced significant technological advancements and scientific discoveries. For the past 22 years, there has been a continuous human presence on the International Space Station, which is 250 miles above the Earth. Uh, now we're preparing to send human explorers 250,000 miles to the moon and then to 140 million miles away to Mars. Uh, we need several years in orbit and on the surface of the moon to build up our operational confidence for conducting long-term work and supporting life away from Earth before we can embark on uh, the first multi-year mission, human mission to Mars. So the Artemis program has plans for our return to the moon with the human lunar lander to explore the lunar south pole. We're going to build an Artemis base camp on the surface, and we're also going to have the gateway in lunar orbit pictured here. The Gateway is an outpost that will be orbiting the moon, providing vital support for a long-term human return to the lunar surface. Gateway is also going to serve as a staging point for deep space exploration. Once in the lunar orbit, Gateway is going to provide a unique platform for us to conduct science investigations in deep space and outside of the protection of Earth's uh, Van Allen belt. Uh, radiation belts. So we're going to have high priority investigations flying on Gateway that include heliophysics, radiation, and space weather studies. Gateway and Artemis elements are going to allow our robots and our astronauts to explore more and conduct more science than ever before. Um, I'd like to tell you a bit about the first two experiments that will be on Gateway. Uh, one is called URSA, the European Radiation Sensor Array, and that's going to help to provide a better understanding of how we can keep astronauts safe by monitoring the radiation exposure in Gateway's unique orbit. And we're also going to have NASA's Heliophysics Environmental and Radiation Measurement Experiment Suite, or HERMES, and that one's going to monitor solar particles and solar wind. These payloads, coupled with the operational experiment experience that we're going to get from Gateway, is going, we're going to leverage that to enable a sustainable lunar operations and help us successfully complete the first crewed mission to Mars. So from Artemis, we're going to gain new experiences on and around the moon, preparing us to send humans to Mars in the coming years. The human landing system is the final mode of transportation that's going to take astronauts to the lunar surface in the Artemis uh, exploration program. And I wanted to share this image with you guys because I just love seeing HLS in the background um, and from this artist rendering and thinking about how fascinating it will be to have astronauts 
uh, regularly and for a long period of time exploring the moon and all that we can learn from that. Here is another image, uh, another artist's concept of what the Artemis base camp might look like. And I love thinking about all that we can discover and explore and learn from this sustained presence. So now that I've shared with you the grand vision of the Artemis program and the large goals that NASA has, I'd like to share with you exactly how I fit into that work. So what is a solar cell? Uh, a solar cell or a photovoltaic cell is an electrical device that converts energy from light directly into electricity by the photovoltaic effect. Solar cells are pretty cool. They don't use chemical reactions and they don't require fuel. They also don't have any moving parts. Now, from an engineering aspect, when something doesn't have any moving parts, it's considered a very reliable device. Moving parts tend to be where things fall apart. A solar cell is a unit that is necessary to arrange a solar panel which is also called a solar array. So a solar array is a large combination of solar cells that are used to generate electricity from the sunlight. So I'd like for you to take a minute and think, where have you seen solar cells and solar panels on Earth? Uh, one of the first things that might come to mind is rooftops of houses or businesses. You might also be thinking of the structures that you may have seen above parking lots lately, or perhaps you're recalling solar powered calculators, or maybe you have lights in your front lawn that are also solar powered. Now think, where have you seen solar cells or solar panels in space? And the first thing that always comes to my mind is our International Space Station. But maybe you thought about some of the Mars rovers or landers you've seen on TV, or maybe your first thought was the satellites that are zipping around the Earth, providing us with technology like GPS and television and other electronic marvels. Finally, I want you to consider what materials are used to make solar cells. I think for nearly everyone, your first thought is silicon. Um, it's by far the most common material used in solar cells, representing 95% of the modules sold on Earth today. Um, you're probably familiar with their dark bluish color, which you can see on this rooftop, and you also can see on the um, functioning side of the International Space Station arrays, those blue wings out are the front, and the orange part is just the back side. And you're um, probably familiar with that look, which is shown here in wafer form. That dark blackish blue color is actually responsible or helps uh, the silicon to absorb so much light and be an efficient uh, solar converter to electricity. And pictured here on the bottom right are silicon wafers, which is basically the first ingredient into making a silicon solar cell. Solar cells are really important to NASA because they have historically powered a lot of our exploration. Uh, the Vanguard 1 orbited Earth, and it was the first satellite to have solar electric power. There was also the Mariner 2, which is a space probe that went to Venus, and it was the first robotic space probe to conduct a planetary encounter. Then some of you may remember Skylab, and that was the first United States space station, which launched in 1973. And I feel like almost everyone is familiar with our beloved International Space Station, which is a multinational collaborative project between the US, Canada, Japan, Europe, and Russia. And it was constructed in 1998 and has had a persistent human presence since the year 2000. Also, more recently, there are the Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, and they were also solar powered. And this particular mission was designed to last just 90 days and it actually uh, survived for 15 years in part because of those solar cells ability to supply power to the rover uh, to help the rover to conduct science and maintain its own health. Spacecrafts traveling far away from the sun have also used solar power. Um, here we're looking at NASA's Juno spacecraft, which uses solar power all the way out at Jupiter, uh, where it orbits the planet. 
Each of Juno's three solar arrays is 30 feet long. And, but I do wanna mention that solar power doesn't work for all spacecraft. Um, one reason is that spacecrafts travel farther from the sun and then solar power becomes less efficient. Um, solar power explorers may also be limited by a planet's weather or their seasons and any harsh radiation, which is types of energy particles that are in space. And also, uh, solar panels may not do well or be able to help explore dark and dusty environments like caves on the moon. So other power sources that NASA uses include uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generators, which convert um, natural radioactive decay into electricity. And we also use batteries a lot. Uh, and then of course, sun, the sun with solar power. Many times the solution for a spacecraft will be combining many of these power sources. And when we're designing a spacecraft, engineers consider where that spacecraft is traveling and what it's going to do when it's there and how long it will need to work. And from those things, we determine the best power system. So a solar cell is an electronic device which generally converts sunlight into electricity. And here we have a simplified cartoon that explains the general function of solar cells. We have incident photons or light shining on the solar cell and that produces a current and a voltage which helps us to generate electric power. So this process requires first, you need that photon or absorption of light into your semiconductor and you need that light to have an energy high enough to raise an electron to a higher energy state. The, um, that generates an electron hole pair. And as your electron moves to the conduction band and moves throughout your device, it generates a current that you can use to do work like illuminating a light bulb or powering uh, your spacecraft. So the last slide really showed us what's going on on a small scale inside the device. And this diagram here shows um, on a larger scale, exactly how that would happen. So we have a thin semiconductor um, that is specially treated to make an electric field within it. So that's positive on one side and negative on the other. And when light of the correct energy strikes that solar cell, electrons are knocked loose and they begin to travel. And if we harvest that energy uh, on the appropriate side, we can form an electrical current and that gives us our electricity, which can be used to power a load. And here pictured is a light bulb. Dave Fidel has a question. Do solar cells in space exploit different wavelengths of light than earthbound units? Sometimes uh, our silicon solar cells that are in space are not very different from the silicon solar cells that will be in Earth. Um, but we also have more um, exotic solar cells that are specifically designed for space. And those will have a wider wavelength or a wider um, in light energies that they're uh, tuned to absorb and facilitate the generation of electricity. And the reason that is, is because our clouds and our atmosphere um, prevent some energies of light from regularly getting to Earth. So the spectrum of light that we see here is different than the spectrum in space. And we'd like to absorb and generate as much energy as we can in space. Great question. And someone else asked, um, how efficient are current solar cells in terms of the percent capture of solar energy? Yes, yeah, so silicon devices that you might see here um, on Earth are about 20 to 25 percent. Um, we have a different class of solar cells, those exotic ones I mentioned. Um, we call those 3-5 solar cells, and they're in the mid, uh, low to mid 30 percent. Um, but we see the theoretical limits are about 48 percent for the different technologies that we're working with. Uh, so we still have some room for improvement. And how, how does that compare with leaves? Leaves, that is a wonderful question. I actually don't know how efficient leaves are at their solar energy conversion. Um, I do think our uh, solar cells are more efficient than leaves though, but I don't know a number. John Joanne, um, have a question. So you talked about you know the, the displaced electron, how, how an electron gets knocked out of its usual position, you know, its usual state in the, in the material and, creates an electron hole pair. 
Um, does the solar cell eventually lose all, its, all of its electrons or do they kind of end up going back to where they started? Great question. It's a closed loop. So those electrons go out and we say they do work and then they come right back. So in a way, it's like a racetrack or something. Um, so we don't lose them and they're able to return and continue to do work for us, which is why they last for so long. And I know solar cells on Earth do eventually degrade, but some of the, I, we have a colleague who put, who put solar cells on his roof, uh, roof, I think about 20 years ago, and he says they're still going strong. Um, is it much harder in space? I know you have much harsher radiation environment. Absolutely. Um, so solar cells do degrade on Earth or in space. <laughs> it is more difficult in space because the we have radiation, we have very drastic temperature cycles. It can go from very hot to very cold very often. Um, and we have some other um, things like ultraviolet radiation or the vacuum of space that make things really difficult. But depending on what solar cells you're using, sometimes space can be a better environment. For example, later I'm going to talk about a material, perovskites. Perovskites degrade when they're exposed to moisture and oxygen, um, which are very prevalent here on Earth and not so prevalent in space. So in that regard, they do a bit better when they get the reprieve from the oxygen and water while they're in space. And one last question from, from Hirsch Matur, who asks, um, here. how about, um, could you say a bit more about how the Mars rovers are powered? Are there ideas we can adapt for vehicles on Earth? Great question. So the Mars rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, had solar panels um, that, you know, absorbed light and charged up batteries, and they operated like that. There is the most recent rover um, that's much larger, and its name escapes me right now. Um, but that one actually is powered by the radioisotope. So you have this plutonium source uh, that's degrading and... Um, and releasing energy and that energy is harvested. So that rover is going to last for a very long time um, with that power source. So I do think um, that for sustainable life here on earth and ways that we can be more green, the um, kind of marriage of solar and batteries needs to be very strong and we need to work on improving both of those technologies. And I definitely think all of, or many of our energy solutions will involve both of those technologies. I would like to discuss the current state of the art for solar cells. Um, so we've mentioned a bit that solar cells that are used here on earth are made from silicon. And that just highlighted here in pink on our um, periodic table of the elements, uh, number 14. So silicon cells have been used and they continue to operate a lot in space. They're also your rooftop solar um, and we see them in lots of opportunities. They're old faithful, very reliable. Um, beginning in, in the 1990s, a newer technology uh, emerged based on gallium, arsenide, and they sometimes include indium and phosphorus. And this has emerged as the gold standard for solar cells made for space. Uh, these are now highlighted or outlined in thicker black borders on our um, periodic table. So we tend to call these devices uh, 3-5 solar cells because they're made uh, from elements from groups three and five on the periodic table. And we also call them triple junction cells because they are actually three distinct solar cells made on top of each other. And, um, to, uh, and that helps them to have a higher efficiency and to absorb more of the light. So that goes back to the question of how are they absorbing differently in the space than they are when they're here on Earth? And three fives are uh, really a special technology used for space and not so much here terrestrially. So the International Space Station arrays are made from silicon, and each of these uh, eight solar arrays that you see here is 112 feet long by 89 feet wide. And altogether, they generate between 84 and 120 kilowatts of electricity, which is enough to power more than 40 homes. Uh, when the space station is in sunlight, about 60% of the electricity that they generate is used to charge the space station's batteries. 
at times, some or all of the arrays are either in the shadow of the Earth or they're shadowed by the space station itself. And that means that they are not actively collecting sunlight when they're shaded. During those times, the batteries provide power to the station when it's not in the sun. Um, some fun facts I'd like to share about the space station. Together, the arrays on the space station contain a total of 262,400 solar cells, and they cover an area of about 27,000 square feet, which is more than half the area of a football field. Uh, the solar arrays wingspan is 240 feet, which is longer than that of a Boeing 777 wingspan, which is 212 feet. So you can get a grasp of how wide they are. Um, also, the space station's electrical power system is connected by eight miles of wire, which absolutely fascinates me. I particularly like this photo because it's a close-up of the International Space Station solar panels, which are silicon, but the astronauts that you see out here, now circled in yellow, are actually installing a next generation solar technology called the Rollout Solar Array. Um, the Rollout Solar Array has gallium arsenide-based solar panels on board. So you kind of see uh, the future while you're also admiring our current technology or a bit of the past um, of, of what our solar can do. Now, the Rollout Solar Array that they were installing on that spacewalk um, is an experiment. It was a test. It's not the new power system for the International Space Station, but here we see it rolled out um, after installation and deployment. Now, this technology is amazing because it's 20% lighter and four times smaller in volume than the rigid arrays that we see on the International Space Station. And it works kind of like how a tape measure does. You know, you stretch it out and it becomes taut, but kind of with a flick, it'll roll back up. Or those slap bracelets, if you have, uh, if you've seen those around. It's that same technology that allows this to unroll um, and unravel. So these cells have a really high power density, which means you can get a lot of power out of them per unit mass. And that's tremendously important for us um, because it costs a lot of money to launch things to space. So the lighter weight it can be, the less fuel and energy we have to use to get there. So we've discussed our silicon solar cells and there's room for improvement in all of our technologies. Uh, the silicon cells generally have slightly lower efficiencies. They're about 20 to 25%. And they also have challenges with the radiation damage when they are exposed to space. Um, since the early 1990s, I mentioned that triple junctions came on the scene, the three, five solar cells. And you can see this picture here. If you can see the blue, um, the yellow and the pink are the three different junctions stacked on top of each other. These typically have power conversion efficiencies of about 30 to 35%, and their theoretical max is 48%. Uh, these materials, however, require a great deal of precision in their manufacturing, which means you need very high temperatures, very expensive substrates, and they require slower synthesis methods. So unfortunately, the resulting cells can be heavier, um, rigid, a bit brittle, and they require a lot of labor to make the arrays. And all of these things result in a high cost. So... I would like to talk to you about perovskites, the next generation of solar cells for the Earth and space. And perovskite is actually a name that refers to a mineral, and it's a calcium titanium oxide mineral. And the name perovskite has also been extended to apply to a class of compounds which have the same crystal structure as that mineral. So you see we have C-A-T-I-O-3, A-B-X-3. So now that A-B-X-3 structure, we refer to as a perovskite structure. Now the materials that we make solar cells with are uh, methyl ammonium or formamidinium. Here you see this M-A or F-A, P-B-I-3. So that's your A-B-X-3 structure. Um, here, and uh, on the left between the gloves, you'll see that's a picture of our perovskite solar cells we make in the lab. And on the bottom of this um, slide, you'll see the crystalline structure. So you can grasp a little bit about how the different sites, um, how the chemicals 
are arranging themselves in this uh, crystalline structure to make this material. There are a lot of different material possibilities or potentials when we're making perovskites. We can change that A, B, and X um, to tune exactly what we would like. So perovskites have a lot of favorable properties properties that make them enticing for space applications, including they can be made really thin. In fact, 500 times thinner than the current state of the art, those three fives I was talking about. They are radiation hard, which means they can experience the radiation of space, electrons, protons, x-rays, um, and they stand up to it. They will still work. Um, they don't degrade so much, which is a benefit. They're defect tolerant, which means if one of those um, A's or B's are missing in their A, B, X, three, they still perform pretty well, which is great. Um, other materials don't do so good if they get out of order. Uh, they can also be made in many different ways by liquid or by vapor phase, which means vapor phases, you can evaporate it or you can use solutions to make it. They have the potential to be really flexible. If you deposit them on plastic or a tape or anything, a foil, they'll take on that shape of whatever you put them on. And because of all these reasons, they're really low cost and they have opportunities for tandems. And tandem is like the triple junction, putting three cells on top of each other, kind of making a solar cell Big Mac, so to speak. Um, but Proskites also have some challenges, and we call those opportunities, opportunities for us to innovate. Um, and some of their opportunities are in the consideration of vacuum and thermal stability. They have a challenge um, when they're in the vacuum of space. They will lose some of their uh, constituent material, and we want to make sure that everything stays put. Thermal stability is also a challenge. And I mentioned in space, we go from hot to cold and back and forth a lot. Um, and that can challenge the material's integrity and its performance. So we want to figure out how we might protect um, or preserve the integrity of the material, even when the temperatures are changing. Perovskites also challenge, uh, have challenges with moisture and oxygen sensitivity, but that's less of a concern when we're in space, because as I mentioned before, there's no moisture oxygen there. Uh, here pictured, I have a uh, image of the solar cell, uh, a schematic of a solar cell, and you can see that your light would shine through your glass substrate, and it would go through various layers in the cell, which I'll describe on the next slide. Um, and the perovskite, the red portion, is your active layer, and that's really where the business happens in the cell, which is why we call it a perovskite cell. So when we're designing a solar cell, we have to consider, uh, take into account a lot of things. And we need, we have needs uh, for each of the layers of a solar cell. They have a job to do. For our absorber layer, we would like it to have high broadband absorption, which means absorb as much light from as many different energies as possible. We want it to have long charge carrier lifetimes. We talked about freeing that electron. We want to free it and we want it to stay free long enough to do work and give us that electricity. We don't want to pop it loose and it falls right back into its spot because it didn't get a chance to give us energy. Um, I mentioned also defect tolerance. If the lattice, if the arrangement isn't perfect, we still want it to perform really well. Uh, the transport layers, whole transport layer and electron transport layers pictured here, HTL and ETL, those help us to make sure the electrons go where we want them to go and that they don't go the wrong way. We want them to have high conductivity, which means if you imagine your electron is a car um, and the, the solar cell or the transport layer is the road, we want a smooth road, no potholes, no down trees, no out bridges. We want it to hit the road and cruise no problem. Uh, we also want those layers to be inert to the absorber, which means we don't want them to degrade the perovskite. We don't want them to make the perovskite uh, perform worse. We want them to do no harm and to help us out. Uh, our contacts also, which is where you would actually plug in, so to speak, um, to get that electricity out. And we want that to, again, be a smooth paved road so your electrons are having no problem. And we want it to do no harm to the rest of the cell. And finally, the substrate, which here I picture as glass. We want that to be transparent so the light can get through. We want it to be flexible so we can put this perovskite wherever we would like to or need to. And we want it to be lightweight, which keeps us to maintain a low cost. Tim's been Googling around and tells us that leaves and plants are 
nearly 100% efficiency, but they only convert about 6% of the energy. Okay. Um, lots of loss due to the chemistry involved. So is, is, uh, I, I gather the structures you're creating in the Perskovites, those are designed both to capture the energy and then to be really good at con converting that energy into electricity. Exactly. So the perovskite itself is really good at capturing it. It absorbs it. And then we're using those transport layers and the contacts, kind of the support material around it helps us to try to be more efficient at getting that energy out so we can use it. Great. And and the gold, what's what's the gold doing? But yeah, so the gold is a contact, which means if you're generating electricity, you need a way to get it out of the cell and to your circuit, whatever you're trying to do with it. Uh, maybe turn on a light or power a fan. So the gold is what we on the outside would say, connect a wire to, to actually extract that electricity. Lance says, uh, there was an article recently about solar cells working at night. Can you comment on that? That's interesting. So um, <laughs> solar cells do need light input. And sometimes that light can be um, from artificial sources. So if you put a solar cell under um, a light bulb, like your, those calculators, solar panels, powered calculators, they will work. It doesn't have to be from the sun. Um, we have been interested in low uh, solar cells that can work in low light. And one of the distinctions that we don't always think about is there's the visible spectrum, which we see, and then there's more energies of light that we can't see with our eyes, but they're still there, like infrared, which we kind of associate more as with heat, um, but it's technically light. So some people have looked into solar cells that could use infrared uh, light. And those tend to be a lower power conversion efficiencies, but it's a possible, it's possible technology. So John and Joan say, ask, um, perovskite solar cells are inexpensive. So why haven't they been developed further up till now? Um, what's the, what's been the deterrent to their development and use? Great question. Um, so they're fairly new technology and they re they probably were discovered for their use in solar cells only about 10 or 12 years ago. And in just about 12 years, they've gone from 0% efficient to like 25%, which is leaps and bounds growth. So we're really on an uptick and everyone's realizing all the potential that this material has. Um, but you make a great point. We need, you know, researchers like myself, we need funding, we need excitement um, and support to get this work done, to get this technology to be as good as we all know it can be. Well, I think it's exciting because gallium arsenide was actually developed here too as a, as uh, by, by one of in, in the physics department by one of one of our PhD students back in the 1960s. So here we That's go, gallium amazing. arsenide in the 60s and now perovskites just down the road at at, uh, at NASA Glen. Let's yeah. see, maybe maybe one more one more question. Um, and they're both interesting, but let's see. The International Space Station must have other power sources, or is it entirely solar powered? I believe it is entirely solar powered, but there's a suite of batteries on there working in concert with the solar panels. So the solar panels aren't directly supplying the power every minute, um, but they charge up the batteries and they're, you know, the backup to help when the sun isn't shining or if the solar panels are shaded. So now I would like to introduce you to the team of researchers that are doing this great work into perovskite solar cells for space. Um, so I lead the team. I also work with uh, Dr. Tim Peshik, who's an alum of Case Western Reserve. And Dr. Kyle Crawley is a postdoc working on this. He's also a Case Western alum. Um, Dr. Caitlin Van Sant is another postdoc helping with this research. And Jeremiah Sims is an electrical engineer. Uh, we also are collaborating with the University of California Merced, Professor Sayantani Ghosh, who's in the physics department, and we have some grad students in her lab, Will Delmas and Sam Erickson, who conduct a lot of optical characterization of the films that we've been making. And we're also working with the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, uh, specifically with Dr. Joey Luther uh, and his group, and they help us to deposit and make perovskite solar cells. So a 
lot of brains, a lot of hands, a lot of institutions behind this great work. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we received funding from NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate Early Career Program. So our grand vision for this project is to someday have perovskite-based flexible solar arrays powering base camps on the moon. So this lightweight, low-cost technology would be perfect for the high power requirements we're going to have for running all those science experiments and sustaining the human presence on the moon and in the future on Mars. So because perovskites can be manufactured in many different ways, we envision a future where astronauts could arrive to the moon or Mars, exit their vehicle, and then set up a printer that slowly begins to deposit solar cells and manufacture solar arrays on the moon. Another benefit to this technology is let's say something bad happens and a solar panel gets damaged. You can just print another one. And how cool is that? So where are we going? I think it's really important to know where you're going so that you can plan what you'll need to survive there. So here we see there's low and mid-Earth and high-Earth orbits. And their largest difference is just their altitude, their distance from Earth. And for this work, we're focusing primarily on low Earth orbit and the lunar surface. And low Earth orbit is between 111 and 1,200 miles from the surface of the Earth. Um, for reference, the International Space Station is in low Earth orbit at 254 miles above Earth. So there are many interacting items that create the space environment. We have ultraviolet radiation, atomic oxygen, ionizing radiation, which are those electrons and protons that are zipping around. Uh, there's the vacuum of space and also thermal cycling, that hot and cold. So at NASA and in the various labs across the United States and world, we have great facilities for ground-based testing, which is, means we're here on Earth and we're doing experiments in a lab. Um, but we also get really valuable information from in-space testing. Uh, and in-space testing is really valuable because here in our labs, maybe we can look at thermal cycling, and then we go to another machine to look at vacuum, and then we go to another machine to look at atomic oxygen. But when we send it to space, all of those things are at play at the same time. And that's really important for us to know how all these things will impact each other together. And one platform that helps us with that is MISI, Materials International Space Station Experiment. And this is typically a six month exposure to low earth orbit conditions because you send your materials up to the International Space Station, an astronaut goes out on a spacewalk and sets them outside on the wing and they fly outside the space station for the duration of the experiment, which is shown here on the bottom right in the image. So we were able to fly an experiment on MISI-13, which is the 13th MISI experiment. And we sent, of course, a perovskite fin film for flight. And this actually flew for 10 months in low Earth orbit, and it survived the flight. So it was integrated into uh, MISI on October 2019, which means it was prepared on the ground. It launched to space in March of 2020, and it returned back to Earth in January of 2021. And we had it back in our hands in Cleveland in the lab in March 2021. And this is what that sample looked like when it returned to us. And I can tell you immediately, we were elated when we saw it because Perovskites in their desirable solar cell phase are black, like silicon, right? They're absorbing a lot of light. You get that dark, rich color, and you want to see that. When they start to have problems and they degrade and they leave the desirable material, they turn a mustard yellow color. So when I tell you the anticipation of opening up the case, fingers crossed to see black, we were thrilled um, to see that this film had survived. So just at first glance, we knew that we had some good news. So I'd like for us to dig in a bit more um, into the specifics of this experiment. So on the left is the photograph of the sample in the Missy holder with the yellow arrow pointing to the perovskite sample. And the inset is the sample post-flight. So you can see before it took off, it was black. When it came back, it was black. That's great. Um, 
while it was on the International Space Station, the sample was aligned in the zenith direction. That means it was generally pointed towards the sun. That's valuable for us because we're working with solar materials. And because it was pointed towards the sun, the samples tend to reach um, a higher temperature. So that means when it was at its coldest, uh, it ranged um, about no colder than negative 20 degrees C, which translates to minus four degrees Fahrenheit. The maximum temperature that this material experienced was 85 degrees Celsius, which also translates to 185 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's some serious temperature swings, but again, our material was able to endure that. So on panel A here, you can see the construction of our sample. Borosilicate is glass. So we had a glass uh, substrate. MAPI is our perovskite. Next is DC93500, which is a space grade um, silicone, like an adhesive. And then we had another glass slide. So that DC93500 kind of works as glue and it encapsulates the perovskite a bit, adding some protection. So that's what made up our sample. On slide B, I wanna tell you that we sent one sample to space we also kept one sample here on Earth, and that's important because the sample that stayed on Earth went everywhere the, that the one went to space went, but one took off and the other stayed down. So that really helps us to compare what changes are just because we're looking at a sample that's 10 months or two years old, and what changes were specifically due to being in space. So on the top of this image B, you see the sample. Uh, an edge on photograph of the sample that stayed on the ground. And we can compare that to the edge on photograph of the sample that went to space. The arrow pointing to a very thin line across um, the sample, that thin line is actually the perovskite. They're very thin. And the majority of what you see here is the side of the glass. So the brown that you see in this panel, the lower panel B, is what happens to glass in space due to ultraviolet radiation. It darkens and um, the glass still performs fine. And that was something that we expected and something that we can account for in our experiments. There are certain types of glass you can send that won't darken that way, um, but we knew this would happen in this experiment. Now, if you look across images C, D, and E, we're looking at photographs of our sample. And in image C, it was taken right after we made it. And in image D, it was taken 290 hours after we made it. And then in image E, it was after the flight. Now, we took these images because we wanted to be able to visually gather what changes happened due to space and what changes happened due to general age or what was always there. And from this image, we can see not that much happened visually from this film going to space. D and E don't look that different from each other. So we were also another good inspection to say space didn't completely wreck this thing. So that's great. So here we're going to compare the control sample, the one that stayed on Earth in the top, and the flight sample across the bottom row. And each are largely unchanged across the timeline until we do a stability test. So the different uh, columns that you're seeing is right after we made it in 2019. Um, we put it through a humidity test. Both cells did the same thing. And then the third column is um, after space flight. And the ground and the control don't look that different. The one had stayed on Earth and the one that went to space. And then the last vertical, you see they look very different. Um, the control sample, we exposed it to 15 hours of constant light. And it turned that mustard color that I said is a sign of a perovskite dying. That stress of the light was too much for the ground sample. We did the same for the sample that went to space, but it could endure that 15 hours of stress from the light. So we were thrilled to see that somehow being in space for 10 months made this perovskite stronger, more stable, and more durable. But why? So I'd like for us I'd like to summarize what we learned, um, some of the things we have learned so far from this MISSI-13 experiment. And we've learned a few things. The first thing we learned is that a perovskite film can survive 10 months in low Earth orbit. And this shocked a lot of people. We had some skeptics who didn't think we'd make it, but we did.
Um, here I'm showing a confocal fluorescence image of our sample being excited by a 430 nanometer laser. Now what this does is at that particular energy of light, perovskite will show red, not perovskite will show black. So you can see that we have some areas of the film on the ground on the top here, large voids, vacancies, no perovskite there, dead regions in our film. Um, and on the Missy film, we see also dead regions, but they're smaller. And we are able to count them and quantify them and see that the one that went to space had fewer dead regions than the one that stayed on the ground. So we were able to see um, that the one that went to space has a higher quality and a better composition because of the density and size of those non-emitting regions. So the Missy flight sample has a higher density of small defects, which means a shorter lifetime. Remember, lifetime is how much, how well those electrons can move around. Um, conversion to the unfavorable mustard that lead iodide is not preferred in space, which is good. We're more likely to hold on to that desirable black perovskite in space than on the ground. Now, what we're looking at here are more of those microscope images, and we can tune the energy of the light that we shine onto our perovskite for different responses. So first, we're looking at the film as a whole under the same, um, under a light that won't excite anything in the film. So we can just, it's just a picture. And then in panel B, we tune the light to an energy that only lead iodide, that mustard, will respond to. And you can see those little specks of green. That's the undesirable lead iodide. And then we tune the light again to get the perovskite to glow. And it glows this red for us. And what we can glean from this is that the black regions, the dead regions, we have identified them as lead iodide. So this really helps us to say definitively, the sample that went to space degraded less and the degradation that did happen is absolutely lead iodide. So we have an identity, a fingerprint of what's happening here. A final thing that we observed here, these graphs tell us about crystal structure. So here I'm showing what happens when we cool the film down to really, really cold, 10 Kelvin, which is negative 440 degrees Fahrenheit. And shifts in this curve let us know about the crystal structure of the film. So for the control, the crystal structure, uh, the control is on the far left, the crystal structure shifts at 148 Kelvin, which is very typical and expected for perovskites. For the sample that came back from space, we saw that crystal structure shift changed to 55 Kelvin, which is much lower than any other people have ever observed. And that means that this material that went to space can endure more drastic temperature conditions before its crystalline arrangement shifts to a less desirable one. So the flight sample is more stable, but after we soaked the flight sample in light for 15 hours and repeated the experiment on the far bottom right, you can see that transition, that crystal shift came back to normal temperatures. So what we know from this is that the space induced effect is reversible. So all of this information together lets us know how these cells will likely degrade in space and what we can do to help fight off that degradation. With everything we do at NASA and in research in general, it's cyclic and we learn and we go. So we build the Missy 13 prototype and we send it to low Earth orbit. And when it returned, we measured it and analyzed that data and we learned from it. The lesson we learned from the sample help us to understand more about the benefits and challenges of this material. And we build the next generation with improvements and modifications. And then that brings us back to launching or testing again. And every time we test 
in our work, I want to emphasize, we're not going to space every time. That would be tremendously expensive, um, but going to space is something that we use more towards the end of our work. In between that and things I didn't discuss today is a lot of our daily experiments in the labs here at Cleveland, at NASA Glenn, at Case Western Reserve, at the National Renewable Energy Lab, at UC Merced, and all of those people, all those places provide more information and understanding to this project. So we've learned a great deal from that MISI-13 flight sample, and we continue to perform experiments with it, with that sample, to understand it more. Um, we expect to be learning even more because we launched a suite of samples on um, MISI-15, including full perovskite solar cells and films protected by other materials that our ground testing suggests will help add protection uh, to these perovskites. We've... Um, and this picture shows our launch on August 29th in 2021, sending our perovskites along with lots of other cargo and experiments up to the International Space Station. Um, we also delivered some samples from MISI-16. So again, there'll be another launch and we'll be sending more materials up for further experimentation. And I love this picture. I think it's a beautiful long duration photograph showing the uh, SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket launching many things along with our perovskites um, to the International Space Station. So all of this work is towards manufacturing solar cells in space. And what exactly is it gonna take to manufacture these cells in space? Uh, we're gonna have to overcome thermal vacuum and humidity challenges. And we've taken made great strides in our lab already towards these goals. Um, we have shown that our cells can survive more than almost 1,000 hours in high temperature and high humidity. Um, we've done 10 months in space, which shows 10 months survival in vacuum. We need to address radiation concerns. I mentioned that perovskites do a really good job dealing with radiation, but there's always room for improvement. Uh, we need to find lightweight space-ready substrates. We're looking at plastics that won't darken like that glass did when they go to space, and things that can also survive the harsh environment of space. We also need to, or would like to, leverage the vacuum of space for deposition. Um, how can we use what we have in the environment that we're in to get what we need and to help us out? Uh, one thing that we use a lot while we're making perovskites in the lab is hot, like uh, raised elevated temperatures, about 120 degrees C. And that helps the crystal to get just the right structure you want, um, kind of like drying paint really nicely um, to give us really good films. And we think we can leverage the sun and the heat of the sun in space to create those high quality films. And we have determined that we could generate a one megawatt solar array printed from just 26 pounds of condensed material. Now, a megawatt um, can power between 400 to 900 homes in a year. So imagine all of that electricity on the moon and all of the fun science and exploration that we can do. So I'd like to leave you with this artist rendering of our vision of printing perovskite solar cells in space. Um, I love this image. We have a lunar lander in the background and an astronaut uh, peeking over as we have hopefully perovskites printing on the moon. Uh, thank you so much for your time and attention tonight. Here are some photos of me in the lab uh, working with some colleagues and doing some outreach uh, as we work on various solar cells for space. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.